this evening by introducing our chair, and then he will be in charge from then on and introduce everybody else. So our chair is Dan Damon, over there, um, and he is a uh, journalist and radio broadcaster, and since 2003 he's been the main presenter of World Update on the BBC World Service. Um, before that he's, he's worked as a journalist, it seems mainly in uh, sort of war zones and, and uh, protests and demonstrations and things that you're... With, with my wife who was a camera woman, so there you are. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'll keep it short Dan and, and hand over to you at this point. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's very good of you all to come. It's warm. So. Would you like to... Oh, you would like to see more audience yeah. if you come to here. Thank you, Jason. Yes, it is, it is warm, so if you want to take anything off, feel free. We have to remember that this building probably was occupied by people in the first uh, stage who wore many more clothes than we do, so we're, we're rather lightweight, aren't we? Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, back in the early 1970s, with a male friend, I joined the Women's Liberation Movement, and I went to a couple of meetings until, quite rightly, they told me to clear off and look after the creche, which is absolutely the right thing to do. I'm telling you that not because I want you to believe I'm right on, which I'm, I'm not, but because I realized then that there's no way, no manner of good intention would teach me what it's like to be a woman in a society that is all about power for men. It was in the 1970s. It still is in so many ways. I cannot believe that we are discussing today whether women can commentate on football. Uh, which has been a, uh, uh, one of the debates uh, on social media today. Uh, similarly, I did an interview just last week about upskirting, uh, and there are many other aspects. Uh, I, I'm doing a piece now about translation, which is also a gender issue. Uh, so we have a lot to learn. And I think any man who thinks that he knows what the answers are, uh, or thinks that men have it tough too, uh, is missing the point. So, um, before I introduce our three guests, I just wanted to mention, uh, to set the tone rather, um, I looked at the OECD survey on how helpful men are in the home. Uh, Britain's about average, uh, the Irish are about average, the Spanish are about 50% helpful uh, Spanish men, and that's surely where machismo comes from, but they're doing the job. I'm sorry to tell you that the most unhelpful are the Japanese, according to the OECD. So there's quite a lot to learn. If you want to know who the most, help, most helpful is, uh, let's hear it for the Danes, who are the most helpful men around the home. Let me introduce our three guests. We're going to hear from Shioi Ito, who has done some very brave work on the attitudes to abuse, to rape, in Japanese society. You might have seen some of the coverage of her on TV on the BBC today. You will see more of it later in the week. Uh, Jason will tell you about that later. Um, Asako Asaki has been working on development issues in relation to uh, women in particular. And she will explain her work and the opportunities for a society like Japan. And Sophie Walker is from the Women's Equality Party who has changed the discourse in politics in Britain. Probably Sophie believes she's only at the beginning, uh, but she's certainly made the tone at least a little more receptive. So thank you to all of our guests. Let's begin by hearing from Shori San, from Shori Fito. Thank you. Jet lagged. Um, thank you so much for coming here today. Um, so, my name is Shiori Ito. I'm a journalist and I'm also a documentary filmmaker. And today I will share my experience, um, which I went through. It's been about three years. Um, I was raped in 2015 
and I'm not here to talk about my experience, but I want to share with you what I went through after the rape because that's the most important part that I want to share with you to uh, make some change. And I going through all this procedure, you know, going to police, talking to investigators, knowing we have 110 years um, rape law, um, knowing um, we have 99.9. Um, conviction rate, which makes so much harder to prosecute sex crime, I realized, yeah, there are many things that we have to change, including education and so on. But I'm not, I'm not rector, I'm not professor, I'm just telling you my experience. And all I want you to do today is to imagine if this had happened to your loved one. It could be you, it could be your daughter, it could be your sister, and this is why I'm here today to talk and share my experience, okay? So, I think maybe I should briefly touch uh, the reason why I um, decided to talk about my experience, uh, about my horrible, horrible experience. You know, no one want to talk about the rape experience, I think, but as a journalist, I've tried, past years, I've tried to tell the needs of change of legal and social system through Japanese media, but in Japan, talking about rape is so taboo and so to have such a strong stigma against it. And I've tried many ways, but the only way I had left was going to public, talking with my face um, at the press conference. I know as a journalist, this wasn't a clever idea. You know, I should stick with third person's perspective, but I, I had to do this way because that was the only way. And still, Japanese media, um, I have to say, we are not having so much of uh, freedom of press. Um, this year we ranked 68, last year was 72. Um, so we are quite lack of investigation-based journalism. And after I spoke up, I also got so much backlash and threat, and some of very nice and considerate people in UK actually reached me out and asked me if I want to move here and I said yes and that's why I'm here here today and decided to um, cover more about what we can do to change in Japan and it's it's been much more easier for me to do this from here because talking about it from inside of Japan has been very very difficult so I'm very happy now BBC is gonna air a documentary about it so the first clip I want to share with you is about women, one of the survivors who reached me out um, about who couldn't go to the police and she's going to describe why she couldn't go. I start getting emails from survivors. That was surprising. I didn't expect that people would start talking to me. Shiori has come to meet a woman who says she was sexually assaulted at knife point by a stranger a year ago. She only ever told one friend and didn't report it to the police.色々聞かれるだけで一滴の水は何にもならないですよ。でも大量に来たら津波になる。みんなの意識がそこに向かうだけでも大きな力になると思う。ずっとしたものが日本に作ることができたら犯罪したいも減ると思う。絶対に作れます。絶対作れますよね
but being enduring, being patient about this pain, being silent, being keeping this into yourself. I don't think it had helped much, and I think that is why it has been hard to people to talk about it. Actually, realized I just realized showing my own self in a clip is a bit weird. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe it's, I should just talk about it by myself. But um, so um, only four percent of rape victim goes to police to report. Um, and the reason why, as this lady described, is because um, most of the police officer are male. It's been a little bit old data, but um, we only have eight female police officers. And what we have to do is we have to reenact with life-size doll what had happened during the rape. And for my case, I had to lay down on the floor and there were three investigators around me and they placed a big doll on me and started taking photo, asking me, was it like this or was it like that? It was the most humiliating experience I ever had. But I know when to be able to report it, this was something that I have to go through. So I have to say there is, yes, a big uh, lack of understanding of what um, rape victims go through. Um, and it's so much pressure for them to do it. Sometimes you have to also have to go back to the crime scene. It's so much. I have to tell you, it's so much. Um, so that is one of the reasons why these victims can't go to report to police. And in the end, I was talking about growing up in Japan, people often think um, enduring your pain, being patient within me, you, it's a good thing because it's it's just gonna finish in by your with yourself. But I we realize being silent, being not doing, being not making any action is actually well, ne not making any change. And so as I told you, the BBC's documentary, the title would be Japan's Secret of Shame. I think shame is always something to do with Japanese culture. That um I think it's often, in Western culture, shame is quite negative, I guess, thing to, when it's, you think about your very, you know, shame, uh, teen, uh, intimidating. But um, sometimes I feel like, as a Japanese woman, being shameful is a good thing. So, there is a saying called, Iayo Iayo Moskino, which saying no, no means yes. And that is also a big part of um, uh, law that I encounter when I realize my the, the, this man was raping me. I say no. I say stop. He didn't stop me when if I begged it in Japanese. So I actually you have to use F word in English, and then he stopped. So I realized wow. Afterwards, I realized in Japanese language. I didn't know how to say it, how to really make it stop. And I, we were often um, told, as a girl especially, that we have to respect men, we have to respect older. So I didn't know how to behave. And he was uh, someone that I was res respect. I had a respect. Um, so that is one of the reason I think it's really hard to talk about. And I want to share one more clip with you. Um, about my visit in university. Tanoshi to Pekka de Monaishi. She Sugoku, Nin, Tokuni, Nihona Shaka, the Chipanko Tabuna, Kotakara Sugoku, Kitetemo Kurushito Moshi. If you grow up in Japanese society, everyone has experienced sexual violence or sexual assault. But not everyone considered it was. Especially when you start using public transportation as a high school girl, that's when it happens every day. So whenever we go get to the classroom, that was always the topic. Today, this man jerked off on me. Today, this man cut my skirt. But this was 
something that we have to deal with. We never report it. なんかそういう中高女子校だったんですね。それでまあ、なんだろう、制服も叫べなかったし、どうにもならないことなんじゃないかって、そういうことを本当に考えて、被害を受けた時にサークルであっても、それを大学の中でサークルの中で言えますか？自分の否定せずに話を聞いてくれる人を見つけるっていうことがすごく
journalist, female journalist, came out to public. No, she didn't come to public, but she came out with her story anonymously, talking about the one of the. Uh, well, it was written in our um, program today, but um, vice uh, finance minister was sexually harassing her, and. She couldn't even report it in her broadcaster, so she had to go through tabloid magazine where they covered my story. Um, and during the same time, I attended um, Freedom of Press Day uh, conference. It was happening in Ghana, and we were, you know, this year's topic was about how we can um, avoid harassment, sexual harassment in media world. And International New York Times, um, head of International New York Times, his name is Stefan. He said that we need more women in newsroom and more women in, in the boardroom. But at the same time, our vice minister, our deputy minister, uh, deputy minister, yes, he was saying that if we have this sexual harassment, then don't send any more female reporter. Send male reporter. So I was so shocked that when the war is going this way, our leader was going the other way around. So I was like, whoa, this is not good. But because of the foreign media, because of the SNS, because of the online um, web news site, I think um, we got so much backlash on his comments, so he apologized for that. So I think that is what had happened in 2017 with Me Too movement and this year, that it's no longer traditional journalism, but also web journalism and social network that has been helping this movement. And I have so much belief in this Me Too movement. I know some people say it's taken in a wrong way, but um, I think Sweden is one of the great uh, um, places to look at after the Me Too movement. They've decided to reform their rape law. Uh, before their rape law was, they have to say, they have to prove that they say no, the victim say no, but now it has, it, it, change to that they have to prove they say the perpetrator heard it was yes so it was great and um, the, their prime minister also say that this would show that the society is standing on the victim side and that's what we have to do in Japan I felt that our leader our society has to show that we are standing on the victim side that we are <coughs> trying to support them um, but unfortunately, um, our law in our we had changed last year. We had changed for after 110 years. Rape law has changed. Finally, it was great that it gave us hope that it can change. But it hasn't changed two major things. One is that the our age of consent for sex is still 13 years old. The other one is that we idea of consent is not written. Ooh, my time is up. Um, and to prove the rape, you have to prove that you fought enough, you've been threatened enough, you've been violated enough. <coughs> so I think we have to start from the idea of consent. And thanks to you guys, um, we've been using a video of a uh, cup of tea. I think it was made by yeah. Thames, Thames River yeah. Police because it, you know we love visual things. So it's been. Um, repeatedly use in university to learn what consent means. So I think that's something that we have to talk about and there are so much things that we can do. But I think the first step is to know um, what is happening, what the situation is. So I'm really thankful for you all the, for today. It's so hot and thank you so much for being here today and listening to me. Thank you. I haven't got a slideshow, I'm afraid. Um, so I'm going to jump about a bit and try to keep you all interested. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for inviting me to, to meet these brilliant women. Uh, it's the best part of my job is the wonderful, wonderful women that I get to meet and learn from and debate with regularly. Thank you all uh, for coming and sitting in this hot room as they've uh, referenced. Um, it's also a great pleasure to be here to talk about Me Too in a way that doesn't frame it as uh, a problem or an overreaction. Um, if I, I think if I had 
a pound for every time I've been asked to uh, be part of a has me too gone too far conversation. Um, I would have uh, my own private funds to plot my, a takeover of the patriarchy. Um, so I'm really glad that we can actually just, you know, start from the same starting point. Um, I think the day we don't have to debate feminist movements is the day that feminism has succeeded. Um, and I think to, uh, until then, to um, every question, has this gone too far, I will continue to respond, are you kidding? <laughs> uh, because as Me Too works its way through all the different layers of all of our institutions, it is revealing the scale of women's inequality right across all of those institutions. So let's look at where it started and how it travelled and what it told us. So Me Too started in the media and the entertainment industries, uh, which is not a surprise at all, because those industries are the very bastions of male power. They tell stories of male power that perpetuate male power and that portray women as being lesser than men. They, it sustains a culture where women are essentially fodder. <clears throat> the media is one of the most important cultural tools that we have. And yet every single day, women's lives are depicted in ways that belittle and objectify and dismiss us. This is why the Women's Equality Party has an equal media as one of our key policy objectives. I, for one, am extremely tired of putting on the TV, uh, waiting for the new BBC Autumn uh, series, and finding that the most that I can hope to be portrayed as is somebody's, well, it used to be somebody's girlfriend, now it's somebody's mum. Uh, somebody's sister, if I'm lucky. We have all the single women who are too focused on their careers, not enough on their families, and they all have a drinking problem. <laughs> We have the black women, there's never enough of them, and those who are are always angry. We have disabled women, presented as largely helpless. So it is not a surprise at all to me that Me Too started in media, because it is absolutely the place where women are most depicted as helpless and inferior. Where did it go next? Politics, of course. Those, that other major institution where men vastly outnumber women. In Parliament, men outnumber women by two to one. In local government all across the UK, men outnumber women by the same ratio. They legislate for the protection of their own privilege. Female politicians, female staff, female journalists, as we saw, who were also here assaulted and harassed by male MPs were belittled, they were patronised by a parliament where the impact of policy making on women is completely ignored. And I have to say, as a politician for women's equality, it really shocked me to see up close how the other political parties dealt with this. Their main approach was to seek to manage it. Parliament, the assemblies, MPs, they all focused on the need for better reporting systems. This will stop if the more women report it. There was very little understanding, first of all, of the fact that those reporting systems are extremely delicate and must be constructed to be independent, transparent, based on specialist training. Not to your peer or the person that you've worked with for the last 10 years, who has a friend, who has a friend, who has a friend, who has a friend. And there is, was fundamentally no demonstration of an understanding of the factors that give rise to sexual harassment. And there was very little focus on the responsibility of those who were perpetrating it. Then Me Too went to the charity sector. Those supposedly good men who think it is okay to rent out the insides of women's bodies. Where aid sector workers arrive in ruined lands, and men see in starving, destitute women opportunities for sex. The 
this quite rightly caused horror. People saw the sex industry briefly for what it is, slavery. But there was a disconnect between what had happened to women in other countries, from other countries, and what is happening to women in the UK. We know that demand fuels sex trafficking <coughs> and the commercialised sex industry. The National Crime Agency right here in the UK has reported recently the highest number of victims of slavery and trafficking since it started collecting data. Across Europe, demand for women and children's bodies is on a larger scale than it has ever been. So in a time when Me Too means that we are challenging a culture of sexual harassment and abuse of women in every workplace, we must not abandon the most marginalised women to be bought and abused by men. And yet that was what was happening when we looked at Me Too stories from the charity sector. It was all terrible what was happening over there. We do want to look very closely at what was happening over here. Me Too has so much further to go. So much further, both in terms of collective consciousness raising, the storytelling upon which so much of the feminism of the 1970s was based, uh, but also in terms of revealing the structural inequality that we must demolish. And in fact, in revealing indeed that this is not about sex at all, but it is about power and women's lack of it. Don't underplay the scale of the task. At its core, Me Too is challenging very entrenched messages about individual responsibility, as we talked about earlier. Women live our entire lives being told that the barriers we face are of our own making and, of, and are ours and ours alone to lift, to lift. We absorb this like the air we breathe. Ladies, all you have to do to deal with centuries of legislative, societal and cultural discrimination is try harder. <laughs> At college, we tie ourselves in knots trying to get straight A's. We tie ourselves in knots to be the perfect friend, to have the perfect body. We walk out in graduation, to an immediate pay gap. At work, we are assigned mentors on the understanding that because we are female, we somehow innately lack the capacity to get ahead. When we don't get the pay rise, when we have our ideas ignored or stolen, we are offered resilience training to better bear up under the strain of being female. When we have children, we are expected to take on most of the care for no money in exchange for manuals on how to be the perfect mother. When our relationships break down, we are sold DVDs on how to get a sexy body again. When all of that evades us, we take up baking. <laughs> or we do yoga, or we run marathons. Guilty. When we are raped, our courts ask us, what did you do to bring this crime on yourself? When we are sexually harassed, society says, are you sure you're not overreacting? It's just a hand on your knee. The most powerful way to explore the myth of individual responsibility is in Me Too. It is to stand beside another woman and say, yeah, Me Too. Because that is the start of collective organising. And it is in collective organising that women find strength. And that is why Me Too started on the internet. And we should talk a little bit about this because it's really important. Because in doing so, it challenges a whole set of ideas about what activism is. And in particular, who is allowed to call themselves an activist. Some people believe that internet activism is less real. It requires less commitment. It's a bit of a cop-out. It's a hashtag. You don't have to show up in person. But there are plenty of women not here, for example, tonight. There are plenty of women who can't attend debates and lectures, women at the margins of the movement, women whose choices are stifled, who are trapped, who are punished by being born the wrong race and the wrong class, as well as the wrong sex, women from minority ethnic <coughs> working class backgrounds, who could never ever see themselves walking into a forum like this, women who are disabled and have to map every single move outside of their homes in terms of accessible transport and exhausting effort. Women who provide care unseen and unpaid and are impoverished as a result. Women who can't afford the tickets or the childcare 
by the time of debates. But who can access the internet, whether it's via a phone, whether it's via a computer in their local library, whose first barriers are those of isolation and loneliness, who become activists first as part of an online community, who are saying, me too, <laughs> because they have realized that no one is coming to their rescue. And there we have it. No one's coming to your rescue. So it's on women, it's on us to rescue ourselves. How liberating. We don't have to wait for anybody else. For all of those women, for all of us and for all of those women who are taking their activism online, pressing send is the first break in their chains. Is there anything more powerful than that? Those messages, short circuit and internet, built by and for men, where algorithms are being written by 18-year-old boys in Silicon Valley, while women are being told they're too stupid to understand technology. Girls in schools are still watching boys being ushered into STEM, while they are told that somehow their biology makes them less capable. Of course we understand this technology. It's the latest manifest manifestation of the oppression that has marked the rest of our lives. The tweets that threaten to rape us. The Facebook threads that abuse us. The Snapchat exchanges where classroom gossip and coerced naked selfies are currency for blackmail. In a world where support at Twitter offers no support at all, and I speak as someone who has regularly filed complaints, reported tweets, threatening to tie me up, make me drink bleach, put me in a burqa. I get an email back saying, we find no action required. Me Too says, we defy this attempt to use technology now to intimidate and to silence us all. Typing Me Too is a moment of self-declaration that opens the doors to the sisterhood. Now, it's been about Hmm, six months, maybe longer, nine months since Me Too started, we are definitely in for a backlash. <coughs> it is absolutely time for a backlash. Fine, bring it. Progress is never linear. And backlashes give us the strength to double down, to hone our skills, to prepare for the next push. Because the third and the biggest challenge that Me Too has to address now is an idea that women who join this movement, who stand up, are victims. <coughs> that women who say, me too, are rolling over, or are somehow seeking their own personal authentication. Again, I have to ask, are you kidding? Have you seen what the media does to any woman at all? Let alone a woman who accuses a powerful man of sexual harassment and violence. They are ripped to shreds. And they are depicted always as one alone, no matter how many of them, a series of unhinged individuals. Because that is the only way to make this movement small. And those who would seek to stop us in our tracks will try to separate us and make us small. And it is, so, it is only when victims of sexual harassment come forward, and it's then and only then, that media and commentators care about rape. I can't list the number of debates where I have been asked to talk about sexual harassment and suddenly everybody wants to explain how very serious rape is. Of course rape is serious. But the reason we never take it seriously except in those kind of debates as a point scorer against the women complaining of sexual harassment is because we never take sexual harassment seriously either. Rape becomes the means to grade all other experiences and find them wanting. And as long as we don't understand and care about sexual harassment, we will never understand and care about rape. And so, while editors scan social media for shots of the accusers in their swimwear, or having a drink, they will also stitch through that narrative of the unhinged woman. Another one that is just as persuasive, and this is the other one we have to tackle with Me Too, which is that all women have achieved sexual liberation, so lads, it's game on! There are two very immediate flaws in this very flawed argument. One is that men do not harass or rape anyone who can fire them. 
They know perfectly well what the game is here. And another is that the destigmatization of sex has not liberated women. It has been co-opted by the patriarchy as a way to ensure that women continue to be enslaved by sex by insisting on our constant availability, judging us solely by our bodies, by conditioning us to believe that any power we have resides solely in how we wield our sexuality. This is not sexual liberation, this is sexual commercialization. And that is what Me Too has to break down next. We have to stop absorbing all this fakery about individual choice, about being strong. Oh, please stop talking to me about strong women. It is no coincidence that the ideal of the strong woman has emerged as more women start to protest about this daily battering. Male screenwriters have suddenly started talking about the importance of having a strong female character who could fight back, preferably in a corset, and shame everybody else who whinged. Me Too is the demand that we look, and we look again, and we look again, and that we be freed from the demand to be sexual in all things at all times. So to conclude, has Me Too done enough? No. But if it has only done one thing, it is this. It has lit a mass rejection that we care about permission to be the right kind of feminist. It has brought about the mass rejection of the idea that standing up to your oppressor is the action of a victim. The next phase of Me Too will fully show what this movement means, which is women side by side speaking to each other and listening to each other. And that when every Every single woman is singled out for abuse, another will stand up with, but most importantly, for her. How do we create a world where there's no need for me too? We have to dismantle the structures of our inequality and build new structures. We've talked about the importance of <coughs> civil society. For me, as a former activist, I felt I had to move from civil society into politics, because I am tired of politicians telling me that women's equality is really <laughs> it is not hard. It is simply a matter of political will. It is a matter of deciding that yes, we can end violence against women and girls, and that no, it is not about funding the police more and training the police more, although both of those things are important. It is about freeing women instead of policing them. That we teach equality in our education systems, that we value and share care, that we equally access workplaces and we pay women equally. Oh! There's a revolution. That we insist that women are equally represented in all businesses and politics, that we insist on a feminist economics. Feminism is not the thing you get to when you've done everything else. It is a political ideology in and of itself. And it is the only political ideology that understands that investing in care is just that, an investment that grows our economy and revolutionizes life for women. It's not an expense. And as I said, we can then also, to tie up to where I began, because I like things neat, to build a media that relies on its success for reflections of diversity and fairness that creates output in which women's lives and experiences and needs are depicted honestly with equal weight where we can also build new technology platforms where women can debate and exchange ideas without being hounded so to all those women wondering about this i say me too does not make you a victim it makes you a gladiator and the more of us that stand together the more the odds are in our favour. Thank you very much.